that they were discovered, you know, by accident by Burke, and but they've had tremendous impact on science in the 20th and now 21st centuries. We heard from Phil's talk. Uh, you know, it was X-ray diffraction that allowed us in the 20th century to understand what the structure of DNA was. Um, but one interesting aspect, if you, uh, if you ended up um, in a hospital like I did last night after having an encounter with my uh, coat um, during an accident in the security check line, um, but, you know, if you get a, if you get a um, if you get an, an, an X-ray in your doctor's or dentist's office, it, 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 the spatial resolution doesn't really look a whole lot better than that original picture that Rodkin took of his wife's finger, right? And of course, the reason is, you know, you're taking a picture. Uh, if it's an X-ray tube, it's an X-ray, it's an X-ray flashlight, an X-ray light bulb, and so of course, it's not very focusable. So, in addition to trying to understand atoms and molecules from strong fields. We would also like to have a coherent X-ray source so that we could do all kinds of the, all manner of the beautiful physics you've heard during your um, during your uh, uh, the, 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 the winter storm here. And so that's one motivation. And of course, you might say, well, so why why don't build, why don't you build an X-ray laser? Well, it turns out we've known for a long time that really that is not practical from an energy perspective. Um, we've known from the time of Einstein that the ratio of the spontaneous to the stimulated emission uh, cross-sections uh, cross are. And so you can easily write down a simple scaling law that tells you that if you want to build a laser based on a population inversion, that you need to increase the power as the wavelength of the minus 50 power. And that it just makes it impractical to get to anything beyond um, you know, the extreme ultraviolet region. By the time you're at a KV, then you need so much power. Um, or a one angstrom laser would take uh, you know, petawatts of power, which is just not practical. And it's for that reason that the first X-ray lasers were demonstrated, um, and that was at 20 nanometers, so that's 200 nanometers, not even in the X-ray region. And that needed the NOVA laser to power it. And it's for that reason also that Phil this morning talked about the beautiful X-ray free electron lasers that lays at you know 15 angstroms, and you know this power law is why that you know it took 50 years after the first demonstration of the laser to have an X uh, and uh, the visible laser to have an X-ray laser, and that isn't based on population inversion; it's based on um, an electron accelerator, and. But of course, uh, and Phil would have told you about the beautiful science you can access. I mean, this is, these are um, X-ray pulses that are super fast, have millijoules energy, and so one can do amazing experiments like try to capture the structure of a biomolecule in, in a single pulse, or understand multiple electron processes in atoms and molecules. But what I'd like to, Try to make the case today is that of course, um, if this if the science that comes out from the free electron lasers is to have widespread application, then they have to be smaller than this kilometer long um, free electron laser system. And also, what I'm trying to show you is that with the tabletop sources, um, although we don't have enough energy to capture an image in a single shot, what we do have is essentially the X-ray version of a white light continuum. So we have the most precise timing ability, in a different way than what Bill talked about, um, to capture correlated motion on multiple sites simultaneously. We can measure that to attoseconds precision and really understand in a molecule or material, you know, how an electron is hopping from one site to another or how these various sites interact. So there are things, there are there's the science that the large-scale sources are best for, and then there's science that the small tabletop sources are best for. And so they're very complementary. Let's, so let's see if I can make that case. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we start with a very short uh, light pulse. We used to think this was short back 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 10 femtosecond laser pulse that, met, that are in many of the of your labs. Um, and uh, then we uh, use nonlinear optics. And of course, the first time people took 
a laser, Peter Franklin took a ruby laser and focused it into a quartz crystal and then generated the second harmonic um, of the ruby laser um, uh, in this quartz crystal and then used a prism to separate these colors. And I think you all probably know that story behind this. Are we not? Is that really true that they're that young? Yeah, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> so who, who knows the story? Here does appear well, here? Because uh, okay. Fra because so four Franklin. years. Okay, so I'm, I'm not too bad yet. <laughs> yeah, all I wanted to say is that, uh, just bragging, that Peter sure. Franken then moved from Michigan to, to Arizona. Tucson. That's right. So, That's so we, can, we, we take okay. credit for him. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, of course, um, this was the first time uh, that anybody had tried to take, you know, laser light and change its color um, using linear optics. And so they didn't know how to do it very efficiently. And so um, the blue light uh, was so dim that uh, when they submitted uh, this, uh, the result for publication in Physical Review Letters, the typesetter thought that the dot of blue light was a, a piece of dust and pointed it out. And so, if you look, and you can, you can search online now, um, and, uh, at, at, uh, just here, there's absolutely no experimental evidence in this <laughs> that there was any second one generation. But, but it's just Brunkenberg and told the story at the, and I realized these, uh, these students are too young to remember the APS Centennial meeting in 1990, but, you know, he said that, no, that there was never an Erasmus published because anybody with a ruby laser, you could pretty much focus it onto anything and you could make second harmonic light from a surface or an interface and so everybody saw the light and so there was no, there was no controversy. And so, so, so we know how nonlinear optics works. Um, the laser field allowed you to take an electron and drive it beyond its comfort zone, beyond it, the har uh, harmonic part of its potential. And when you drive the electron and harmonically, and then decompose this anharmonic motion into the Fourier components, you need not only the fundamental frequency, but you also need to have the second harmonic and such present in the emitted radiation, in the second harmonic process. And so essentially, what, what um, our field has been doing for the past 25 years or so since we've understood this process is, you know, one way of looking at it, um, of course, it, this is in, in retrospect, is is, and from my perspective, is you know, just saying, well, so what are the limits of nonlinear optics? You know, we can take it from a single atom or a single um, a frequency conversion step, and, uh, you know, how many photons can we add together? And then, to actually have that light be useful and bright, you know, what is the limit of phase matching? I mean, how, can we add many um, harmonic photons from many different emitters so that we get a bright beam out. And the, you know, the answers to both questions are actually surprising and our field is still learning um, new physics um, even, to this, even to this year, 2012. And so essentially these initial experiments um, took lasers um, in the uh, near infrared the ruby laser and converted it to blue and now what I'll tell you is that what we'd really like if we had it is a 20 micron laser. If we had a 20 micron laser, we could convert it to 50 kilo electron volts. And so it's actually uh, you know, quite a surprising um, outcome. So, uh, so th this ability to be able to add many laser photons together, uh, this was, I won't say discovered by accident. It wasn't an accident. Um, Charlie Rhodes and his group were looking, trying to understand how atoms and molecules responded to ultraviolet laser fields. Ultraviolet lasers were developed laser, later than visible lasers, and we could, one could make uh, short pauses in the ultraviolet quite readily using um, excimer lasers. And they made a surprising discovery that they could see not only the third and fifth harmonic, which might be expected in a perturbative process, but the, that they also saw the 17th harmonic of this ultraviolet laser. And that definitely was not um, expected at all. And it became more and more clear that there was something different in this extreme nonlinear optic interaction than in traditional nonlinear optics. Um, in particular, um, from work by um, 
John Macklin, who was in Steve Harris's group at Stanford, and beautiful work by Andrew Ye and others. Um, I know you might not be able to see it too, too well here in these um, old physical review letters um, from 93, but um, what this figure shows is if you use a Thai sapphire laser, that one could see harmonics up to the well above the hundredth order. But the curious thing here was that all the harmonics had the same intensity. And this was very different from how people understood nonlinear optics. In nonlinear optics, what you expected is that the more photons you try to add together, the higher the order of the nonlinear process, the harder it is to do, the more laser intensity you, you need, and, and the less bright you expect the outcome. And so this showed that definitely there had to be sort of a, a new um, way of looking at nonlinear optics developed. And in fact, that same year, the first uh, theoretical interpretations, or the first quantum interpretation, first quantum models were developed actually the year before, and the intuitive interpretations were developed um, that same year. And essentially, we know now, um, Henry likes to um, call uh, the strong field process here the last fundamental thing we learned about the hydrogen atom. Um, so it's okay, so long as it's all um, AMO people we're talking to and, and not high energy physicists. <laughs> and so, um, so essentially any atom or molecule, if you place it in a strong um, you know, femtosecond laser field, um, the femtosecond laser can rip part of the electron from the ground state, um, accelerate it away from the ion, and then when the laser field uh, reverses, that electron can recombine and uh, give up any excess uh, kinetic energy as a photon. And uh, these, uh, this beautiful picture was developed by a number of people, by Ken Kuhlander's group, Paul Corkum's group, and uh, there's a quotient paper that also has a lot of this. It? And uh, so now in retrospect, we can go back and, uh, and also say that we can also think about this process as actually exactly what you would do if you try to uh, build a coherent version of the X-ray tube. So essentially, um, you know, we know in an X-ray tube that uh, you heat a filament, boil electrons off that filament, accelerate them in an electric field, and then when the electrons hit a target, you get essentially um, an X-ray light bulb. So if you wanted to make that process coherent, you'd like to have, you'd like to start with the electron in a coherent state. And what better coherent state than in the ground state of an atom or molecule? And then you've got to accelerate that electron in a coherent field, and the laser is the best coherent field we know. And then you would need the electrons to recollide with the coherent target, and the coherent target in this case is the electron recombines with the part of its wave function that's not yet ionized. So it's a perfectly coherent system, and as a result, we do get out coherent um, x-rays, since the whole process is coherent. So, um, and I think one thing that makes um, this area of uh, physics, uh, you know, attractive, at least to people in, in my field, is that you can understand it intuitively using very simple, you know, pretty much undergraduate physics. And you can also understand it using advanced quantum methods and there's a one-one correspondence between the two, so it, it, there's some very beautiful analogies one can make. So, so it uh, makes it uh, very nice. And so, um, what I'd like to first uh, explain to you is, you know, how we can very simply explain this process as translating this coherent oscillation energy of an electron driven by a strong laser field, and how we can just uh, you know, take that coherent oscillation, coherent <coughs> electron dynamics, and then explain you know, what the, um, the, the, the highest energy photon uh, one can generate, and many other aspects of the emission. So, um, so, so it turns out that the maximum photon energy you can generate is just given by the energy in the system and so the energy one liberates from the system is you have to ionize the electron, so you have the ionization potential. And then you also have this uh, Riggle energy, and the Riggle energy is just given by what's called the ponder-motor potential, which is just um, 3.2 times this ponder-motor potential. The ponder-motor potential is just the average oscillation energy of an electron in a laser field. 
And what I'm trying to show you uh, just in a few view graphs how we can have a very simple scaling law that still holds to date. This, all these scaling laws were developed way back in the uh, early 1990s and uh, they still describe the physics as we understand it. And so essentially it's very attractive from a point of view of making coherent x-rays because what it's telling you is that if you want a higher photon energy, you just either need to increase your laser intensity or the laser wavelength. The laser intensity you need to ionize is not that high. Uh, you know, a standard laser now that's used in chemistry materials, not to mind the advanced physics research, can easily make a spark in there. So, so these intensities are very modest. Everything I'm going to talk about can be done with a few millijoule laser that now fits, you know, in a fraction of an optical table. So it's all, you know, tabletop physics. So, oh, wrong direction. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is just, uh, you know, look at the organization. Was this covered in, um, in Mete's talk or in uh, Andreas's talk, this physics of tumbling? I just don't want to repeat too yeah, much. Yeah, he, 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 but, but you know, I think that repeating a little bit is it's right. Okay, but I only have one view of my tumbling because it's, I, I, I it's that, something that yeah. you, um, everybody has taken a, Mechanics, but, but it's new for many of us, so oh, okay. hearing it the second time. Sure, sure, years. sure, Pierre. A any questions? You know, we, hey, we need five questions. We do need five questions. <laughs> okay. But don't worry. I, I, you see, I know I'm not here, so this is, you know, so. so, so and I'm Irish, I like to talk, so I <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so this is a little, you know, schematic of uh, <coughs> the uh, electron in the ground state. <coughs> the, Coulomb field of the um, atom being distorted in the presence of the laser field. And of course, if you can imagine as you begin to distort the Coulomb potential, then depending on the frequency of your laser and how much you depress the Coulomb field, how, how much you depress the Coulomb potential, you can see that the part of the electron wave function will have a chance to tunnel. Now, for your quantum mechanics, maybe if I ask you one to get things started. So, for quantum mechanics, you know, what will the tunneling rate depend on? Height of the barrier and the width, exactly. Essentially, for the atomic system, it's you, you, you'll see all of the things you might expect. You've got the ionization potential in there of the atom, because that is your you know, depth. And then you have also the electric field of the laser, because that will, um, uh, the, the applied uh, electric field, which will determine how, uh, the height. Mm -hmm. And so one can, with very simple um, you know, physics, as, as outlined very nicely in this paper, and an Iranian that actually fixes the, um, some of the uh, formulas in this paper, one can very easily write down an expression for this tumbling rate. And it just depends on some Clutch Gordon coefficients, the applied uh, electric field, and the ionization potential. And it's interesting. Um, yeah. And so, what you expect, of course, is so in the if you think about the atomic field getting distorted by an alternating laser field, when do you think the electron will be most likely to tunnel? The maximum. Maximum, exactly. So you get the tunnel ionization will be strongly peaked at the crest of the laser field. And of course, since it uh, peaks at these crests, if you plot the ionization in the medium that's shown here in blue, um, as a function of the laser field shown here, shown here in green, all of the ionization pretty much happens near these peaks because there, it's in the exponent. And so you get ionization really happens as a stepwise process. You irradiate an atom, yes? So that formula doesn't have to work with the area anyway. Oh, here, that is such a good question. I, I stopped myself mentioning that because Carl Wadden has taught us that you, should, you shouldn't introduce extra, you know, ideas <laughs> into a view graph, so I've been trying to take that to her. But that's going to come up later. Um, of course, the wavelength will matter. Because if you take, say, a helium atom, it does matter. And if you radiate it with um, an intense field with the same intensity that has the uh, 4 micron wavelength or a, um, say, 0.2 micron wavelength. In one case, you're pushing the Coulomb barrier up and down very fast because your frequency is very high. 
then it's harder for that electron to tunnel, all right? So you've got to, if you want it to tunnel, you've got to turn up that laser intensity much higher. Whereas if you have the slow pondering, the four micron laser, that takes a whole 13 femtoseconds to do this, you know? Then there's a lot more time for tunneling. You don't need to, um, you don't need to apply quite as high an, an intensity. But, um, yeah, but for a given intensity to a first approximation, it's independent of wavelength. But of course, when you take the dynamics into account, it's not right. But that's a very good question. And you can see this, you know, the, 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 the potential, of course, is, is switching. Um, Lou might talk about later that it actually does matter. I mean, of course, if you're looking at the electrons, in one case, it, the electrons coming part of the wave function is being emitted this way, and in another case, it's have a cycle later, it's being emitted in the other direction. Here, we're just plotting, you know, the ionization in the medium, you know, how much of, of, of the electron wave packet is ionized. And then the beautiful thing is that you know you you can assume that the electron is born with zero velocity at the position of the ion, and so then to calculate the energy, all you have to do is take Newton's second law and integrate, which of course we can all do since our freshman sophomore, is that right? So it's a very simple, relatively simple calculation. We just the you know force an electron in an alternating. Um, Field, we just write down as the charge multiplied by the, the electric field, integrate to get the velocity, and then um, integrate uh, once more to get the position. And all we need to know is when is the electron born, but we know that because we just showed you it's just tunneling. So you can calculate pretty accurately if, where in the cycle the electrons are born. And then just integrate, and so you can make a very nice plot of what that electron is doing, or at least different parts of its wave functions are doing, depending on when tunneling happens, and of course it happens um, over many times in the laser field, if the electron is born at the very peak, it will move away and then have the cycle later move back, but unfortunately that electron is not much good if you're trying to make an x-ray because it was born with zero velocity, it gains a lot of velocity, <coughs> it stops, returns, but it arrives back with zero velocity too. So it has no energy to give up, so you don't get any x-rays. But if the electron is born just a little bit after the peak in the pulse, it will move away. This is the electron position as a function of time within the optical cycle. The slope is the, the the slope of the position versus time graph. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So you can see that this is you know this electron will come back with a fair amount of, of uh, energy, and that energy is what gets converted uh, to coherent X rays. And you can see some electrons will never make it back. So they're no good to us at all. They're very useful to Lou, who'll talk about that later, all right? Because they still have information about the atomic and molecular system, but harmonics only capture those trajectories that return, because they're the only ones that give us an X-ray. Because you have to get back to your part, the part of, the electron has to go back to the part of its wave, wave function that's not ionized to get an X-ray out. Um, but it's interesting, um, now these days, because we've got more advanced imaging, we can actually, uh, I just have one view graph on this, because we would do this much better, but this is, um, we can look at all these electrons, actually, and it, they're very beautiful images that are now possible. You can put some time um, position sensitive detectors, put your um, atom uh, with some guiding um, uh, fields, bring in your laser and then capture that electron and it's very beautiful images. Um, I think, Lou, are you going to talk about these images? No? Okay, so then I, well, I was relying on you, okay. <laughs> no, okay. So, so the, the nice thing is it, 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 they can show us very clearly how the physics has changed. Yes? Good question. So, uh, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't electron Uh, with non-zero velocity, yes. energy combined? Yes. Oh no, sorry. 
all the electrons that, um, are born to the first approximation of zero velocity, but depending on when it's born, it requires different this is energy. This is separate issue. So, yeah. what if you have such a strong field? In order to know physics, you would expect that yes. the harder you drive a process, the higher density you have, that you'll see more of the effect. Yes. But what if you have such a strong field in the first place that distorts the potential so that you get over the linearization? Yes. And then electrons are yes. part of the And I'll show you why that that is exactly what we thought for about the first 20 years. And then we realized that no, um, that's actually not how the, 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 it is how the physics work. You can do over barrier ionization, but if you're trying to make um, a bright light source, that's not what you want to do. But it's exactly what, we, what, the, the, what our whole community did for 10 years. So I'll get to that. Okay. Um, yes? That's kind of a stupid question. No, 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 there's no stupid questions. Uh, when you say an electron is born, what yes. exactly do you mean by that? That's a very good question. And I would have a quantum simulation, but I can show you that exactly. Essentially, all we're saying is that um, that you've got your Coulomb, pretend my head is the um, ground state electron wave function here, <laughs> this is Gaussian, and, and this is the Coulomb field going up and down. So I can emit hairs, <laughs> you know, different direction bits. So think about it as a cotton candy. And so if you depress your Coulomb barrier, you pull out some of the cotton candy. And, and so you've got some of the electron wave function in the continuum, and most of it is still in the ground state. And then over time, you pull more and more of it out. Eventually, if it's hydrogen, you pull it all out, then you, you no longer can make harmonics because there is no electron there. So when you say an electron is born, that means an electron yes. leaves? Uh, it means part of its wave function. Um, if you do a high, a high, an intense enough field, you could depress the barrier so much, you could pull all the electrons out at once. But it turns out we're not in that regime. We're in a regime where there is only a small amount of the wave packet tunneling on each half cycle. Okay. And I'll show you that more clearly in the, in, the, in the movie. What do you mean when you say an electron is born? Oh, that part of the wave function, the tunnels, yeah. is now is free. The, uh, Adam has recorrected, uh, recorrected. It, it's free, it's born. It, um, okay, I'm mixing classical of quantum ideas here, and I can understand why you have questions. And it even gets more interesting. But you can think about it as a part of uh, you. The correct way is the quantum model, but let's do the classical just for now. We'll pretend there's a little part of the electron wave function. It sees an electric field, of course, it's going to move away under the action of that field and return. The quantum picture would help a lot. But, but maybe the reasons. confusion is that the electron was there, it's just its tunneling part which is born, right? Only the tunneling part is born, a very small yeah. fraction of it okay, when it's so tunneled. So you're to the tunneling part, I was just Yes, the part that tunneled. Okay. Yes, the part that tunnels, and I realize that I'm using very soft language. Yes, I hope in the next few graphs to be able to. But actually, if I, this is why I was. Um, you might wonder. So this is essentially um, this is a very nice paper by Mark Rocky that that um, uh, these are and these are images taken in our lab. This is actually what the electron distribution looks like. Um, the momentum distribution if you ionize an atom in a strong laser field. And what the structure is due to is, you know all those trajectories we talked about? Well, they all acquire a different phase as they propagate. And the interference between all those trajectories gives rise to these electron holograms. And essentially, um, which of course, um, you know, so, so, so when, when we can have a picture, just like we saw with all the talks this morning, when you see a picture, it suddenly makes the, often it makes the physics easier to understand. And essentially what you're seeing here is when you ionize an atom um, with a high frequency field, um, the barrier is being uh, switched so rapidly that tunneling has a hard time occurring, especially if you keep the intensity the same. And what you see is isotropic multiphoton ionization. You see these rings. Each one of these rings is a multiphoton absorption process. Whereas as you go to the slower <coughs> mid infrared, there's a lot of time to, for tunneling to happen. And then all those trajectories we talked about, that depending on when the electron is born, all of those trajectories then interfere, and you get these um, structures that are essentially um, related to holography, not, not exactly. 
So I think we covered this already, that we integrate, we uh, just wanted to show you just because it's, 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 it's a nice result. If you integrate and get the velocity and then just calculate the kinetic energy half mv squared, you get this, um, uh, and then take an average, a time average, you get exactly what this ponder moment potential I told you about. And this is just uh, Newton's second law applied to a free electron in a laser field of frequency omega. And you notice you have the electric field squared divided by the frequency squared. This, of course, is the laser intensity. And this, of course, is the laser wavelength squared. And that's, that is that result. I said the scaling law comes from freshman physics, pretty much. And then we get this factor of 3.2 because, of course, some electrons get more than the average. And so if you calculate what energy do they gain as a function of time when they're born, you get up to this 3.2. Um, and those are just the ones that actually return to the ion. Electrons that go away can get more energy, but they're not the ones that the x-rays um, are concerned about because um, if they don't return to the ion, they'll get an x-ray. A little bit more. That's three questions. Am I right? The three questions are. Um, so let me go on to the quantum picture and we'll do Apple seconds later. Okay, so so I was being very sloppy about you know saying oh the electron is born and it's not born and it's sort of you know this is sort of a much better picture of what's actually going on. It's trying to represent <coughs> this one as this field driven wave packet as the laser field is, is alternating. Because if we pull out a little part of the electron wave function, and then it moves away and then, well not so much move away, but, but it's driven in one direction and then back. When it returns to the core, you get these beautiful um, quantum interferences on this spatially modulated wave packet that's um, modulated in, in space and time. And when you think about it, if this, if this wave packet was not there, we would never get any high harmonics because, of course, think about um, if you drive an electron at some frequency omega, what will your radiated field be? That frequency, exactly. Now, if you have a spatially modulated wave packet and you drive at a frequency omega, but if you calculate the time-dependent dipole moment, the time-dependent dipole moment on something that's spatially modulated will be much, much more rapidly varied. And essentially, that is the origin of the harmonics. And, and in the little video, um, I, I, the, or the movie, uh, Second Sense Group, I'll show you that. Um, because these are the quantum pictures that were uh, beautifully loved by Ken Kulander and Manchef Neustein. And I think, you know, in our field, one thing we love is the fact that um, the three step model of this ionization and then propagation and then recombination is also there in the quantum mechanics, because in the quantum mechanics, what you consider is, um, you know, this tunnel ionization, followed by propagation of the wave packet in the field, where it requires a quantum phase, and then recombination as a dipole transition back from the continuum, back to the ground state, in the laser, in the laser field. So it's a dipole transition from the ground state into the continuum, Propagation in the field where you acquire quantum phase and then another type of transition back. So at the beginning of your lecture, you reminded us about um, uh, uh, second harmonic generation uh -huh. in, in, in Franklin's experiment. And then you said, well, um, but in these things we have to take a, a very quantum point of view. Yes. And this picture is, yes. is very different from the idea of driving something beyond its harmonic limit and producing higher harmonics. But you, implied just a little while ago that if you were driving something in the presence of spatial modulation, then you would get those terms that would lead to the higher yes. harmonics. So yes. what's the relationship between this picture, which seems very different from the usual non classical nonlinear optics, and this nonlinear optics picture that says that I should have a polarization that's oscillating at the X-ray frequency in order to radiate X-rays. No, you do. You, you, there is a beautiful analogy, and um, you know, early work by Pascal Sayer and others, uh, you know, show that analogy. 
But what the nonlinear optics approach does not get is this phase right. Because if you do it, that is the quantum phase that the wave packet acquires. And it turns out it's huge. That quantum phase, um, if you think about the electron and its trajectory, it, it acquires um, the harmonic order in radians of phase, roughly. So it is huge. It is, it is almost it's a, a dominating factor. So it's nonlinear optics with a quantum phase included. And is that the thing that tells me how big the harmonic is? No. Or that it has that frequency? That is that, no, that is, no, that is, that, that is, this, that is its phase. You can get the um, energy of the harmonic just from uh, Newton's second law. You can get the fact that you have nonlinear polarization from, from sort of a, an anharmonic potential analysis, but you cannot get the quantum phase if you don't do the quantum mechanics. So you can make, and I think that's why you know, people like this area, because there's a lot of sort of things where the semi-classical picture will tell you everything, or, but in the end, only the quantum picture gets the So you're saying, I won't right. know the phase of the, the emission x-ray. With respect to the laser field. With respect to the laser field. Who cares? Oh, Bill. <laughs> 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 Remember, this is not new optics. This, and look, if you're trying to look at this electron and sort of, you know, and, and use, it, and if you want to take, if you want to add these two um, X-ray fields together, you're saying if I, I won't be able to figure out the phase matching part. Uh, yeah. Oh, but but not only that, you can't. I mean, I I I am. Um, I, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why you can't even understand process because for, for example I kind of skipped over this but these two trajectories come back with the same slope yeah because there's an optimal trajectory that acquires the maximum energy mm -hmm. these two have the same slope but they don't have the same phase so it has huge implications <coughs> even in the single atom emission <coughs> because you have quantum interferences occurring everywhere if you don't understand then you can't either look at them and use it to understand electron-driven dynamics, or decide you'll manipulate them, you'll, you, you'll use it. So it's, it's infused in everything. It's infused in everything. But let me show you the little movie and see if that helps. Um, yeah, so this quantum phase, very interestingly, it is roughly proportional to the laser enhancing wavelength squared as well which is very interesting because it can be the laser you're using for harmonics or it can be a superimposed field. You can't do this with nonlinear optics. You can't just shine another light field and manipulate your medium. But this gives us a way to do all kinds of things that we didn't have before. You don't have with traditional nonlinear optics. You can, with traditional nonlinear optics, you can engineer your medium, but you don't get to change it completely by just another light field. Can I, I'm just thinking about that phase, and if I think about a phase like an energy times a time, um, then uh, like can I sort yeah, of break down the sort of a long amount yeah. of potential yes, over a certain time exactly. period time? Exactly, 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 exactly. But the nice thing is that it's proportional to the total laser intensity, so it gives you all kinds of ways. We haven't even begun to exploit this aspect of harmonic generation because it's just a little tricky to implement. You might. Um, but, but it's still very, it's very rich um, future work. So this is a little, um, it's a, this is a very old movie that, um, but hopefully it still has some um, use. So what you see here, if you're ready to stop, is this is our cooling potential, and this is our uh, electron sitting happily in the ground state. But now if you notice, as the, um, let me just stop for a moment, whoops, did I do something? Sorry about that, I'll start again. And so what you'll see up here on top is the laser field, and this is the ionization. And so the laser field peaks at time zero, so now we're just beginning to perturb that Coulomb field. And now look at, now we see tunneling. Now you see, and, and so you, so of course, th this is the 1D version of the little pictures I showed you. Interestingly, so here, since the electron is ionized, the harmonic emission terminates. And right? it's a hydrogen, you know, one, one, one electron atom. So although the field is still perturbing, um, well, there, this really doesn't exist anymore, I guess. But but, uh, but it shows some nice aspects. Um, it shows you that the X-ray emission is all <coughs> the laser balls, and that's why we can take a 
15 femtosecond major pulse and make a nanosecond pulse if we want. But it's intrinsic to the process. You, know, it's, it's, you don't have to try. You know, the ionization really only takes a few optical cycles to happen. And you can see, this is an old simulation, but you can see that the ionization is sort of roughly stepwise. Actually, it actually decreases a little bit every step. Um, because, of course, um, quantum mechanically, you know, there can be a little bit of... Uh, that's a detail. Okay. So, everything I told you pr pretty much uh, was understood one way or another by 1993, pretty much. Um, and so, but one thing that took us a long time to figure out was, you know, could we combine the microscopic and microscopic physics? And one reason, I think, was that for a long time there were two different communities looking at it. There, and, it, you know, now in the last 10 years or so we sort of merged. But for a long time one had, you know, uh, there was only a few people who spanned both the atomic physics and the optical science. And so it took, it took a, a longer to figure out some of this physics. And so you would think, so to make any nonlinear optical process efficient, you need to phase match the process. So you need to um, be able to guarantee that the emission from all of these different atoms in the medium adds in phase at the output. You might think, well, this has got to be easier than your second harmonic generation, because second harmonic generation, you have to worry about the fact that the index for the second harmonic light, the green light, for example, is different from the index of the blue light, of the driving red light, and both of those indices depends on the material. Now, it turns out that um, in the soft X-ray region, uh, as you know, uh, materials don't bend light. Right, they go straight, their index is one. So you, you, you might ask, well, how hard can it be to force the laser light to travel at the speed of light? But it turns out it's, it is hard because, as we just talked a lot about, uh, the medium is ionizing right, as you're generating the harmonics. And that's shown here. Every time you get a jump in ionization, there's more plasma present. Um, it turns out the phase velocity um, of the laser light in the plasma is greater than C. The X-rays really don't care if the electrons are free or bound because they're well above any resonances in the material. And so that meant for a long time, actually, it was thought impossible to phase match this process because it's, um, the index of refraction is dynamically varying. But fortunately, for uh, about a tenth, of, you know, for a half an optical cycle, um, the ionization is fairly static, and so you can phase match during that time, and so it actually does work. Um, um, so th this is um, so in the visible region of the spectrum, to phase match, one worries about matching um, the refractive indices. Right? Here, um, what we worry about is matching the wave path, and we've got to take into account that there is this quantum phase. So uh, one can do it lots of one can uh, implement phase matching lots of different ways. One can do it in a gas jet or in a waveguide, or a, if you have a lot of energy, you can just do it in a big focus and you have a, a very uh, long uh, focal parameter. Um, but no matter what way you do it, you have to match the wavefronts um, and of both the laser and the X-ray, and it's. In our group, we like to do it in the same way geometry because it's easier and because when you take the quantum phase into account, um, it, it's much easier because the quantum phase actually falls out for now until you want it, until you want it to contribute because if, if the intensity is, the laser intensity is constant, the quantum phase is also constant, it doesn't change. But in, in a focus, it's a little harder, but you still can. There is still a region here after the focus where you can take advantage of the momentum of both, due to both the quantum phase and the uh, fundamental laser light and the generator harmonic and, and match all, match them all so you can uh, implement phase matching. So, um, so in, in our group what we do is put gas inside a hollow waveguide and then uh, tune the pressure and if you think about it, when uh, laser, when, when any light 
passes through glass or a material, it slows down. And I told you that the uh, phase velocity of light speeds up in a plasma. And so it turns out there is an optimum ionization uh, level where those two uh, speeding up and slowing down processes balance. And so um, at, in a waveguide, it turns out there's a geometric term as well. And so to balance um, all these different contributions and force the laser light to travel at the speed of light so it's matched to the x-ray with just too much pressure. And so this is very much like maybe all lasers are so automated. Now, did any of you ever do an experiment where you adjusted the angle of a second harmonic crystal to maximize the output of the <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, birefringent phase matching, the, when we translate that to the extra region, it's because we do pressure tuning, or in a gas jet, it happens at a given ionization level. So it works great. You get a laser-like beam out. This is young double slit. Um, and, and it is perfectly laser-like. You, you cannot, it, 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 its coherence properties are uh, just fabulous, both uh, spatially and temporally, and many, many groups around the world have checked this. It's, it's uh, quite amazing. Um, uh, the only issue for a long time was that the uh, region, we could make these bright beams, were really restricted to the extreme ultraviolet region of the spectrum, but for many applications, you'd really like to um, image thick materials or access higher photon energy so you could get to um, higher spatial resolution imaging. Or if you want to look at correlated electron materials, you'd really like to be able to access the L absorption edges of those materials, which are in 700 dB. And so the, there was, um, we were very interested in seeing was there any way to get to higher photon energies. And there was. Um, as I told you, this um, we know the scaling rule. It's tremendously favorable. We just need to increase the laser intensity or increase the laser wavelength. So this is back to your question now. What happens if you just increase the laser intensity? It works great, but uh, we know from our tunneling that if we increase our electric field, we'll increase that tunneling rate, we'll increase the amount of plasma, and soon the laser phase velocity is much greater than the speed of light. And you can no longer match um, the phase velocities. And so you can generate harmonics, you just can't generate bright harmonics. And, and so there's been lots of work in this area. Um, this is a beautiful work from Ferenc Krauss's group where he increased the laser intensity and decreased the pulse duration. But the problem is, since you don't phase match, that th this is the intensity from the um, extreme ultraviolet to a KV, the intensity drops very rapidly on the log scale. And so you get maybe one photon every 100 shots. So it's a, it's a photon counting experiment to see those very high harmonics. Uh, so we only have one other norm, right? That if increasing the laser intensity doesn't work, we'll try the wavelength. And it turns out that does work. Um, and uh, it's, so, uh, and, and of course it, it is very attractive, because uh, if you look here, so what's shown here is the laser field of a Thai sapphire laser at 800 nanometers, and then the uh, electric field of a laser at twice the wavelength at 1.6 microns. And of course, because when the electron tunnels near the peak of the field, it has um, more time in the field, it returns to the ion with, as you can see, a um, higher, uh, higher slope or higher velocity, and so higher energy, and that just scales. And so it looks great um, that if you keep the laser intensity the same and just double the wavelength, you get four times the energy in, when the electron returns. Um, there was one big issue for a while, and that was that because the electron spends more time away from the atom, the quantum diffusion of that wave packet is very severe. So, and it is, the scaling on that is very um, challenging uh, in that it scales to, as the, the quantum diffusion scales as the wavelength, actually it's more like the wavelength of the minus seven or eight um, effectively. So that 
What that tells you is that if you double the laser wavelength so that you can get four times the photon energy, the electron is about 100 times less likely to recombine with the atom. And uh, that is work that was beautiful work from Kmete's um, group and uh, Lu's group and such uh, in understanding this physics. And uh, the, what was surprising is that if you actually calculate then uh, <coughs> phase matching, as you know, in the mid infrared region of the spectrum, the refractive index in materials is actually quite small. So it turns out that to balance the dispersion, you actually need to use very, very high gas pressure. At the same time that all the materials are becoming more transparent, and this is why your technician uses a lead apron, you know, x-rays are very penetrating as they go to higher photon energies. So it turns out that if you plug in and evaluate, you know, phase matching at very high photon energies for long laser wavelengths, um, you essentially what happens is if your laser wavelength increases, you need a lower laser intensity. We talked about tunneling ionization being in, roughly independent of the wavelength. So you just ionize the medium less. And the same phase matching then, just um, instead of being limited to 150 dB, just um, go, uh, if you increase the laser wavelength, uh, the prediction from, um, that Tenio made was that phase matching would work all the way to a K B and higher. And the surprise for um, us was that actually it, you know, it, it does work because you, we were sort of sticking our necks out a bit, saying, well, we'd go from IVB to a KV, but that's a factor of you know, 10 in, sort of the, in the physics with all of this quantum diffusion happening and such. And we didn't, we did, we didn't think that this, you know, this simple formula would actually work. But the reason it works, it turns out, is that as you go to, into the mid infrared region of the spectrum, tunneling ionization becomes more and more dominant because that coulomb function is depressed for such a long time. So the, the electron dynamics are very strongly correlated with the laser field. And so a simple analytical formula like this still works because of the, um, the physics is, is uh, favorable. And so we checked out, um, you know, does this really work? And, and it does. This is, these are all the experimental points from our group and this is from um, Professor Major Kala's group showing that, it, you know, as you have a longer and longer driving laser wavelength, you get um, uh, bright beams at higher and higher photon energies. And the most recent work was um, a, 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 a surprise because instead of getting, you know, the, we were used to getting a comb of maybe five harmonics if we drive higher this process with the trisapphire laser at, eight, at 0.8 microns. But if, the, if we instead use a four micron laser, what you get out is a, an X-ray supercontinuum. And this process is very like, many of you may have seen the photonic crystal fibers because they're used a lot, for example, to, for carrier envelopes of phase stabilization. Oh, okay, can I finish the sentence and then I'll, uh, have you, you know, where you take a femtosecond laser and you put it into this, you know, this designer, um, uh, this designer crystal fiber, and you get out this white light that's completely coherent. But here what we do is instead of using a nanojoule in, and you get out white light in the visible, we use a millijoule in, and you get out a coherent X-ray continuum. And the interesting thing is now, it, at the same time, it spans all of these um, absorption edges, and this highest point here um, corresponds to adding 5,000 laser photons together in an efficient way because it, it, it implements a 5,000 order process and also phase matches that process. Did you have a question? Yeah, so if, you, if you're if you increasing the, uh, the pressure yes. and you're ionizing all of these atoms, yes. why doesn't the electric field from all of the other atoms interfere with this? Uh, That's a great atoms? question and I'm going to get to that. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We did worry about because by the time you're trying to to uh, phase match a four micron laser, you actually have to go from pressures in the wavelength of 30 torr to 30 atmospheres. So we thought that actually the laser beam wouldn't even stay together, but actually it does. Um, and uh, 
it turns out that the um, efficiency is constant all the way from 100 EV to uh, a kV. And that's just because you're having to use higher and higher pressure as you go to our proton energies, and that's compensating for the, single, the low signal atom yield. And also the gases are becoming more transparent, and so that was quite interesting. So there was a long time where um, we just didn't have any ways of doing out a second science at proton energies above 150 EV, but now in the past couple of years, um, using these mid infrared lasers, we've been able to take these out a second pulses um, into the KV region. And so the other thing we learned is that, you know, so if you want to make the most efficient process, and if you have a UV laser or an infrared laser, you know, what, are, what is the optimal place to do the conversion? And so it turns out that if you have, for example, if you happen to have a 5 EV VUV short pulse laser, then, of course, the refractive index here and in the vacuum ultraviolet is, is changing rapidly. So it turns out you can pretty much convert to one bright 11th order process. Now, if you want to get to the EUV region, then you want to use a near infrared laser. And if you want to get into the X-ray region, then you want to use the infrared laser because neither of these can, even can face match. And so the interesting counterintuitive thing here is that you don't want to use the lower order, lowest order nonlinear process. But that would have been what we thought um, until we understood how both the microscopic and macroscopic physics work together. Um, previously, you would have said you would always want to go to the lowest order process you can in implement, but it turns out you, you don't face much there, so you just can't do it in a simple scheme. There are more advanced schemes that can get around this, but none have been demonstrated experimentally yet. So how do you then, suppose you want to do some spectroscopy yes. or something, how do, yes. you, how do you select? See, so you don't. You don't want to select until after the sample, and I'll show you tomorrow why. Okay. Because, in, you know, these, these pulses are, you know, they're chirped, um, but, they, but they're perfectly synchronized to the okay. second level. So if you want to look at a charge transfer or a correlated motion in two different elements, what you'd like to do, because nobody can get time zero so precise, so what you do is you shine all the light on, take all the data, post-analyze, and then you have this, this is what I was talking about, the super continuum gives you a precision that you can't get even using, by tuning one color and moving it. If you try and do a pump probe without a second precision after you've messed up your experiment, this is hopeless. You will never regain that precision. So that's why the super continuum and I'll, I'll, uh, um, uh, so so uh, this is sort of maybe more for the experts uh, in the thing to look here is this is our driving laser wavelength up to 10 microns. This is the generate harmonics to 